Hello and welcome to the Arc Daily and Life Cycle series of talk. In this panel, we will discuss future cities and the crossover with technology with guest speakers, Kim Van Hosbeke, Design Director at Skidmore Owings and Merrill New York office, Ariane Dingste, Director and Senior Architect at UN Studio, and Jacob Kirk, Partner at Hanning Larson. Welcome, hi guys, and welcome uh, to this conversation. So today's cities may uh, face many rapidly rising challenges and opportunities, and the digital revolution is driving change uh, in every part of our lives. Our guests will be sharing with us their ideas and their experiences on how we can build a better future. My name is Kisa Haru. I'm a content editor at Arc Daily, an architect and an urban designer, and I will be the moderator of this conversation. Hey, everyone. So let's get started. So the first question goes for you, Kim. Uh, so the current COVID situation has a huge impact on the entire world. So cities, the epicenter of transmission of diseases, have been hit the hardest by the coronavirus. So do you think uh, COVID-19 will change the way we design our cities? And do you think, or do you think it's gonna speed up uh, existing evolutions? Well, uh, there's been a lot of uh, talk and reading and writing about this, this topic. And, and so there's a lot of uh, ideas out there. But I think uh, regarding to the city, I think it's important to remember that this first and foremost is not a city or urban crisis. It's really a health crisis. Uh, and so when we look at the, the reason why there's urban questions about our cities, it's really through the lack of being able to deal with this health crisis, uh, which is a unique event has in some way, but on the other hand, it's already happened before. Uh, and so cities always came out through these events uh, better than they were before. Uh, and so we should think and look at this event as an opportunity to make the city better than it already was. Um, and the situation we're all in here is really about how to deal with the health crisis and, and our leaders partially inability, especially here in the States, to deal with it. Uh, a lot of the challenges of the urban fabric that we are now all uh, really put in, in the middle is that we're missing the, the things we like about cities, uh, which is the density, the social uh, contact, the fabric. Uh, and we've been seeing that for the last 20 years as a big driver of, of uh, society, uh, both socially and economically. And I don't think this, uh, uh, pandemic is really changing the course of cities and their roles in in, in, uh, in, in that path. Uh, I see it more as an opportunity uh, to really see the things that were not working yet, like social uh, fairness, uh, enough access to outdoor space, uh, about social equality. And so those things are highlighted very strongly in the pandemic because those differences in different neighborhoods are becoming predominantly very visible. Uh, so Ariane, the same question goes uh, to you. Do you think we're gonna, uh, we're gonna see a change of behavior in the, in the design industry? Uh, yes, for sure. I think, um, I think with, with every crisis, I think we see a big spark in creativity and, and solution finding. So, so I think there, there's the, the saying of never waste a good crisis, I think also really goes for this COVID situation. Uh, we can see that inside our office, we have several work groups, both from, from urban product design up to architecture, really working on this topic right now. And, and I think it's going to disrupt certain typologies that, that of buildings that we have in our cities, and it's going to change the behavior of people in the city. Um, but I think it's going to be for the better. I think it really will spark our ideas. And I think, at least within Europe, see, uh, we see that there's a strong urge to connect also this crisis in, in investments in what they call the Green Deal. So really focusing on the environment and sustainability as an opportunity. So really, in, in, in this area, to kind of spark that evolution and, and thinking for a city. So definitely it will have a big impact, uh, but, but I also see that it will have a positive impact. I think every crisis sparks that creativity and will kind of force us in, in new ways. We can simply not continue the way we were doing in the past. 
and, and uh, it will mean a disruptive change on that level. And Jacob, do you also believe that uh, it's going to have like a positive impact or do you think it will be just a short term effect and then stuff will be back to the way they were before? I think actually it's been uh, an extremely healthy uh, rain check on all of us, but also the planet itself that we pulled the plug for some months. Uh, it might have been su and will be super, super expensive. But I actually think the outcome of what happens post uh, the COVID-19 is going to um, make us all better, but also kind of uh, make our priorities better uh, going forward. Uh, we know that the world population is growing, uh, urbanization is uh, kind of full steam ahead, but I think at least for what we see here from a Scandinavian perspective or kind of a design ethos that the human scale, but also the diversi diversification of how we create cities uh, will be even greater after this. Um, so I think it's for the better, but I mean, it, it hits us hard, all of us, uh, but it's, we have to look for the long term and, 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 and kind of forget about the short term. So I also agree that it will disrupt, but I think for the better. Right. So since now the concepts of community are unfortunately in a way dissolving in the midst of all this social distancing and social isolation uh, lifestyle. So I want to ask you, what do you, how do you see the future of neighborhood, community, and social life in uh, the city? And um, maybe Kim can give me his opinion on uh, the American city. Yeah, so I think, like I mentioned before, I think the neighborhood and, and the city as a critical aspect of, of our, our being uh, in this world uh, has been highlighted as being essential no matter where you are in the countryside or in the city, if you have a lack of social access and interaction, we are all craving for that. And so uh, more than ever, and there was a lot of evolution and, and ideas rolling before the pandemic. And so I see really these, these ideas about how the social fabric is the catalyst of our, our cities and, and of how we engage each other is becoming really a f the, at the front of how we think about our neighborhood, how we design buildings, how we design neighborhoods, and what are the things in those fabrics that are essential to make them successful. The lack of these things is now highlighted, uh, especially you know across larger cities and, and, and where some areas are very well provided by these uh, amenities to provide neighborhood feels and access, others don't. And so that is, that, that is highlighted. And so the, the need for good neighborhoods is just highlighted in a very uh, critical way and, and, and emphasized as a, as, a, as a critical point to continue developing. Uh, and this uses as a catalyst to really get leverage uh, and a broader buy-in to, to uh, support those needs. Even with all the social distancing measures required now? Well, the social distancing is, is the method of trying to manage the health crisis. And so uh, I think like uh, Aryan said, we're really looking at the long distance. We have to manage the health crisis now and work through it, finding a vaccine or being able to test more frequently. And once we have that in place, one can restart the social fabric of neighborhoods. Uh, and so that's really the crisis. We, we don't have a health solution to either manage or solve the health crisis that is putting us and disconnects us from the, the neighborhood. Uh, the long-term view is really looking at when we're past that, we've learned things that we're missing or lacking off and maybe things that we should do differently to allow for a better utilization of the, the neighborhood both in normal condition, but also in case of a pandemic or a similar situation. And Jacob, do you think that at Hennig Larsen uh, neighborhood and community, will uh, you will design them in a different way after the pandemic? I hope there will be the twice the size as before, because that's the, we can see the result of uh, the, the, the master plans and the urban uh, designs that we have done, that actually during the last uh, months with COVID-19, they, they, the, the public realm has been used two to three times more than before. And that, that comes back to what we talk about, the need for social interaction. 
uh, and we are not very good at being grounded in our homes for for a long term. Uh, uh, so, so I think the, the there is an urge uh, inside all of us that we, we would like to go out and meet and socialize. But it also comes back to the kind of the, the healthiness uh, of, of of things uh, that we we would like to move around and so on. So, I think this the spaces will remain. I think there will be more. Uh, diverse in in their appearance but also in certainly also in, in the performance of the recreational spaces that we are designing both within the city but also you can say in the suburban or even in the outskirts because you have you have seen a huge shift of people who are kind of clustered in the cities they want to get out they need to get some space but if you cannot facilitate them in the outskirts where predominantly elderly people who are the ones who are also most vulnerable ones are so they don't want to have people coming from the city out so i think we end up in a kind of dilemma there so and and we want to, to stay friends uh, with with all our relatives and families for a long term so i think uh, again diversity in the public realm is going to be essential uh, so you can kind of absorb but f- facilitate the urgency because you can say uh, i mean in terms of buildings we probably not going to go away from high rises and so on. But maybe we're going to think, we're definitely going to be thinking about next time we go into a high rise, like who am I standing shoulder to shoulder with in the lift, even though it might be contactless in the future. But I mean, do I, I, mean, do I want to be there? And I mean, of course, I cannot take the stairs from, 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 from ground floor to the 20th or 25th floor. Uh, but if I can have a breathing space around it, maybe then I can, we can all find a way how to deal with it. Uh, Arjan, I think... Uh I'm pretty sure that you also like to join uh, uh, in the same vision that Jacob and uh, Kim have been talking about. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's, it's like that was, was mentioned. I think there are certain typologies of, of buildings that, that really need rethinking. Um, like for example, high-rise typologies, they, they will be most challenging. And, and I think it's indeed about um, the the concept of, of efficiency that we've been driving, of course, are a lot of our buildings with in the past and also our public space. And, and I think the social distancing is showing us where we are short in space, both on the public realm and inside our buildings. And, and, and that's what I meant also in the beginning. It, it really needs to provoke our thinking. And, and I think there also, we also discover good sides. You know, I think the a lot of employers see that actually that home working uh, is, is not bad for, for people, at least not for productivity levels. And then there was, you see also, I think there was a recent survey where 50% of the people said they would really like to continue with a large portion of their work in, in home working. They also discovered themselves that it's, well, uh, it's working quite well. So the, the question is, what will this mean for our cities? Will this mean a move to the suburb or the outdoors, as was just mentioned? Or does this also work within a city framework? Um, I think the, we also don't want to kind of promote even more heavier commuting. Uh, the public transportation systems are under quite some stress right now and are also one of the other bottlenecks, I think, next to the kind of high rise typologies. So I think uh, we are learning new ways. Uh, I think we're discovering our way in, in how that could potentially impact, but I also heavily agree we should not think from the current status of the crisis. We should really look beyond and see how our cities and our lifestyles have to, to evolve with that. And I think this is the important thing to address. And I think designers have a very important role in, in showing and guiding people to walk this new path. And since everyone's like talking already about public spaces and transport, I wanna ask you like, do you think this pandemic is an opportunity to promote uh, slow mobility and a healthier lifestyle and encourage people to walk and cycle rather than actually taking the car? And are you designing uh, projects, uh, projects with extra focus on uh, pedestrians, on uh, bikes and keeping the car away from, uh, from, uh, from the project? Uh, can you let me know what you think, uh, Jacob, about this? Now we love uh, our bicycles in, in Copenhagen here, so and uh, that seems to be a healthy uh, mean of transportation also with the COVID-19. Uh, but I think the the uh, you can say when we think about cities and we want to take people out of the cars and into the public transportation, I think there I mean there have certainly been some 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 challenges and how to cope with that because I mean 
the public sector ha have been reducing the number of trains and metro and so on. At the same time, we encourage people to, or we kind of reinforce people to, to use the public transportation. So uh, that actually have meant that in a lot of the greater cities around the, the, the world, there's been fewer trains and actually people have been more packed in it in a time where we need to keep the social distance. So there's something that we on a, on a global level somehow we haven't really coped with or haven't been prepared for how to deal with that. Uh, I think it all, I mean, all the larger cities or the cities with metros and so on, it actually took them a little bit of a, while, a while to rethink that it's not about slowing down the number of trains, but it's actually speeding it up because otherwise people will be packed and it's not good for the uh, yeah. pandemic. Um, but uh, I, I, I think the, the way of, of, of living and using the city is not it's not really going to change. Uh, I think uh, there will be a stronger focus on the healthier lifestyle and being activating what you do. And maybe this has just given us not a gentle, but a, a firm push on this is very important, uh, but also the, the importance of, I mean, having uh, large uh, amenity spaces or breakout spaces within the building itself. Of course, you cannot, again, how do you go from the 25th floor and down and all? I mean, so there's been many talks. Of, I mean, we talked that about the last 20 years about roofscapes and activating and so on. But I, I, we believe that the terminology or the use of amenity space and maybe the extent of the amenity spaces, I think, and I hope that there will be a change of how to see that and perceive that, but also hopefully there will be a demand for a greater uh, and a more diversity of amenity spaces within uh, within an office space per se, because I think uh, kind of a more traditional uh, core and cell office scheme, but just where back to back with your colleagues, I, I think, or at least I hope that's not, that's a no-go in the future, yeah. if you don't have that breathing space one way or another. Yeah. The, well, I'm going to ask also Ariane, and what is the... At, uh, you answer you, what is your approach to future mobility after the pandemic? Well, I think that uh, it, mobility, of course, is a very broad, broad term. I think we've been working on some innovative uh, concepts over, over the last years. Uh, had the opportunity to, to work on the cable car system design for the city of Gothenburg. We're doing one right now for the city of Amsterdam. And, what we've discovered with these projects that, that, of course, people always look at it like, where can I put my skis to, to go up to the moon? And what we've seen is that this is actually frequency transportation and, and it will not have waiting lines and you can have very high frequencies in transporting people with having a new cabin coming every 40 seconds. And I think it's these kind of, kind of mobility concepts that work on high frequency instead of trying to push as many people in, in single carriages to, to spread them more out, not having groups of people waiting together, but working with high frequency. And I think you can do the same for, for mass transport, transportation on the level of metros and trains. I think on the level of, of, of like using bikes and, and pedestrian, um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming and I'm working in a country where there are more bikes than, than people. Uh, on average, we have 1.5 bikes per person. And, and I think we're quite uh, used to that as, as a means of transportation. I think it's interesting for us, in our, like for example, in Italy, that got like, the, of course, uh, attacked by the COVID, that there are certainly people really who are starting to take the bike instead of using the car. Uh, I think it will provoke these kind of changes in, in cities where people actually could just as well take a bike. They're just not used to it. You know, we, we I think our kids can probably cycle before they can walk. And I think if that's kind of, if this is where you grow up with, and this is the kind of framework in which you operate, then we will also drive our cities to, to facilitate that. So I think that's one of the positive aspects. It's not going to be the solution for everything. So we need to also solve it on the levels of, of mass transportation, trains, uh, metro systems, and, and I think cable cars could be a good addition to that. And, and the thing that I'm a little bit concerned about is, is the, um, the individualization of, of transportation. I think we've seen pretty bad impact from, from concepts like, like Uber on the cities. I think, uh, well, Kim, you can talk from that from New York. but. Yeah, you basically have empty cars driving around waiting to, to pick somebody up. And I think this is not the way to go. So if people only feel safe in their own cocoon 
uh, I think this is definitely something we should not move into. So I think this would be for us at least one of the challenges that we really need to think about, like increasing frequencies, uh, increasing capacity, but also how do these kind of, kind of station buildings function that, that facilitate people to use this transportation. And, and I think it's a bit trial and error right now with putting all these kind of stickers uh, on, on public spots where, where we learn how to behave. And yeah, on a certain moment it will become a natural. But I think we need to really focus on, on the positive sides, but also find solutions for the things that, that will need to happen differently. So now also right. like we have Paris and uh, London that are also following up this, uh, following up uh, the footsteps of Milan and they're also repurposing their streets for bikes and pedestrian. And uh, Kim, the question's for you now. How do you think New York is going to follow in that trend and especially that you all know the importance of public transport in a city like New York? Right. Uh, yeah, the health, you know, I think, mass transport is critical for high density urban fabrics. Like they can function without. Uh, and New York is one of those prime examples that, you know, it's been a city that never sleeps. And the only reason it never sleeps is because the public transport kept running day and night. Uh, this pandemic actually created the very first time that subways closed uh, to actually give the time to clean and purge every car and really deep clean it. Um, so I think that, and it started also to show that the mass transport is the main means for the lower and middle class to commute to jobs that are not able to do from distance to remote. So I think the, the essence and the need for good uh, and healthy uh, public transportation is even again highlighted through these, these events that, that it's critical to allow for the society to work. The, uh, and so there's going to be a different look. Uh, to date, it's been about capacity, 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 and, and trying to just uh, serve the exploding population. But I think the change that will happen is, and, and, and to some uh, transportation like airports, that trend was already happening about wellness and health, and how do we experience those nodes? And so in transport, train station design and, and uh, train cab design. I think that there's going to be a change in thinking uh, more in regards to health and wellness and how we interact with those environments. And so that's, that's a critical change. The other thing that happens uh, is obviously the discovery. I think like Aryan uh, suggested, people suddenly realize because they don't want to be in a subway. Well, let's do a walk. A walking 10 blocks is not too bad. Uh, it's actually almost as fast as walking to the subway, waiting for the subway and then going to your destination. So the, uh, and the same with bikes. Like last weekend I was biking around and, and I've seen a change over the last 10 years here in New York uh, in cities like Mexico or biking was like, oh, no, I don't go on a bike. Uh, so that's a trend that is, has been changing. And I think this COVID is event has uh, brought in that awareness to a much larger group where people are now jumping on a, on, on a bike. So in the bike stores are like running empty with bikes. Uh, and so the city is also taking the opportunity since there's no, nobody driving to the city suddenly to change some of the streets and making them for bikes. And uh, so these are the things where the opportunities rise is to fast track things that were happening in a much bigger and bolder way and, 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 and use them as a catalyst to change how we commute and move through cities. And, and I think about, especially on the, the micro transportation where it's for shorter distances, if we can enhance pedestrian pathways, bike paths, uh, moped like smaller uh, steps etc for short distances and take that pressure of commuter out of the trans mass transport and use the mass transport for the longer distances uh, we're going to get a much more integrated uh, ways of transportation network in these urban cities and give it if a choice right if people are not comfortable at some point to go one way there's a choice to do it a different way so again to me it's really an opportunity to to push forward the things we've all been talking about in a much bolder way. So since I think if, if, yes. if I can just reflect on, because I think uh, I totally agree with Kim and, and Arjen is, is saying here, I think we also, I mean, we have to, there's two mindsets that will be really, really good to change. That one, one 
one set is the one set the municipalities that require uh, the parking ratios, even though we're not going to be using it. So if we look into life cycles and CO2 emissions and so on, we, why do we have to keep on providing the number of uh, car parks in our buildings? Uh, it's expensive and we don't want to, basically a city don't want to get that amount of cars into the city. So if you, if you could start to uh, kind of bend the rules or challenge the rules in a way. I think that would be a good thing. But also the, the mindset of people, because uh, I mean, we, we're working on a project in London at the moment. And when, you, when you're walking in the streets, I mean, in London and other cities, bicycling is considered as a sport. I mean, you can only be on a bike if you're dressed in a very super tight Lycra and you have to run 50 miles an hour like you're in the final sprint of Tour de France. Whereas in, in in Holland or Belgium or in Denmark, I mean, it's, it's it can be a sport, but it can also be a way for giving A to B in a relaxed mode and enjoy life. You don't have to be super sweaty. You can actually wear normal clothes. So, but I think it's it's a mindset thing that that I mean, slowly but uh, hopefully is 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 evolving as well. But I think it, the moment that where you don't, you can actually provide the bicycles in in the streetscape. You can park them, but also that you don't have to provide the parking spaces because as, when you provide them, people will use them, and we need to shift that a little bit or try to lower it. Yeah. Like a city as New York, 25 or more than 25% of the surface area is allocated for cars. When you think about that, it's crazy, right? And so if you would take even a quarter of that and transform that into other modes of transportation, other uses, public outdoor space, pedestrian paths, bike paths, that would be transformative for any city. So it's, it's really about that opportunity and, and, and working with the municipalities to really uh, help us to allow change to happen. And since we are talking about change and design, I wanted to ask you, how do you think public spaces will be designed after COVID-19? Will this also, will this coronavirus also have an impact on how we design our public spaces, where people meet, where people gather, et cetera, especially like in a city like New York? But I think what I, I think will happen is that there's, and I mentioned this before, it's more about the same needs are still going to happen. And, and it's creating a diversity of outdoor spaces. Some are more for individual, more intimate relaxation. Others are for uh, collaborative socializing events uh, and anything in between. Some are greener, some are hardscape that are flexible for other uses to come in that, you know, like markets and, and, and other social uh, programming. I think there's just a bigger awareness that some areas, especially here in, in, in the States, some areas are very well served with a diversity of outdoor spaces like Manhattan. And part of it is because the uh, constituents that live there uh, support it, vote it, politicians hear it. And then there's other areas of, of, of the cities that have a huge lack of those. And when we look at the uh, caseloads uh, of COVID in a city like New York. A lot of times it's the areas in the city where there is a lack of ability to distance socialize, uh, where the, more people live in very tighter quarters because they can't afford their house. There is not an ability to have outdoor space where there's room for relief in cases like this. And that's really where the higher uh, cases are. And that's not just New York City, that's even in rural areas. And so I think it's about awareness of a equal uh, access to those types of amenities in a diverse way. Because ultimately the city relies on every segment of the population to be an active and a successful urban environment. And in New York, we have a whole section of a population that doesn't have that is highly affected and can can really contribute and then there's a, a section that can operate in these unique circumstances and, and so there's a huge disconnect um, so that i think is more about awareness of where outdoor spaces exist and what types and making sure that they're accessible to the larger uh, society uh, Arjen, in uh, europe we are seeing now that a lot of unconventional uses are being introduced to public spaces like uh, cities are opening up their public spaces for restaurants, for example, etc., to help the economy. Uh, so how do you think this can be a temporary approach or do you think this will lead to uh, a future like uh, 
new design of public spaces as more, as Kim said, diverse uh, entities. Yeah, I think I think the, it's about distribution. I think we already have the, these qualities. I think that the, I think most European cities, you know, they they they, they dwell on their, their kind of food and beverage features with terraces outside. And I think making now more public space available for that is is, is really related to this kind of social distancing. I think the, it, what it shows is that this is the need of the people. People want to get together. They, they want to be able to, to sit in the sun and, 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 and communicate and interact with people. And I think the question is probably much more about the diversity of use in, in public space. I think one of the concepts that, that the way we also look at buildings is, is, is like to really kind of think about like how can you kind of program your day in, in a building. And I think you could look at the same way in, in looking at a city. And it, because when we look at a building, it's basically bringing the kind of features and the kind of freedom you have in a city inside the building. And I think this COVID situation shows us right now that the kind of diversity of use uh, should be really addressed. And I think it's not only diversity of use, but it's also diversity in, in user groups. And I think we should look much more integral. I think there are really nice examples of where they bring, for example, uh, kind of fitness, outdoor fitness possibilities together with, with play gardens to really kind of, kind, of, kind of purge the kind of social interaction between different age groups. And I think you could look with the same kind of glasses to the kind of urban space. How can we create double usages? How can we have groups meeting that normally would not interact? And I think like the, there was the notion of equality and, and access, and I think we need to look where are things distributed in the city? Where can we connect programs? Where are things missing? So people don't have to move around uh, on the city uh, without any reason, just because it's not there. So I think it will spark the thinking and I think it should be much more thought through on thinking through the time of the day and thinking from different user groups to really get that diversity in the double use in a smart way, but also distributing it equally over all the cities that the accessibility is, is also solved. Jacob, so uh, talking from the Danish experience of public spaces, what can you tell me about these, uh, um, uh, this diversity in spaces, in these outdoor spaces? I think it's, uh, it's quite important that they are adaptable, uh, not only in size, but also in, in, in use. Uh, and uh, the more the merrier, uh, so they're not reserved for a few and uh, a sign that says, please don't enter, or don't touch. It's, it should be the, op the opposite. Uh, we also see kind of a, a great uh, appetite and interest in uh, taking part uh, of, of the local community. Uh, so we are all uh, on our f phones and gadgets and flying uh, around uh, the world and so on. But when you are home and when you want, you want to take part of the local community and uh, kind of you enjoy uh, taking part of the urban farming and you support the local microbrewery and, 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 and the, the local football club or, or, or whatnot. So, so I think there is, I think also what, what the, the two gentlemen are saying, I think there's somehow you downscaling the cities or you, you start to understand your local neighborhoods a little bit more. And somehow they become smaller communities that then have a distinct identity and use and you are kind of the, the, that you know who's around and you you feel safe and protected somehow uh, and that also is related to how you use uh, the the um, the public realm and the creational spaces um, and it's important that they, they can be used for all it's not only the ones who are super fit and slim and fast but it's you can actually just take your blanket and use it and uh, as in the same way as anyone else uh, so in that sense i think this about the performance of the spaces are, are, are really really important you should feel at home and you should take proud of the spaces that you are within should feel like you belong to these uh, public spaces mm -hmm. in your city that would, that would be nice that would be nice <laughs> okay so Let's discuss a little bit. Uh, let's go. Let's talk about technology. And um, I want to ask him, what is your experience with uh, like new technologies that could impact our ways of living, and uh, how we design and construct uh, our cities and buildings? So it's, it's an interesting topic because uh, when you look at uh, so there's two questions that you in, in that one question. One is how do we design? 
and construct and how is technology uh, changing that? Uh, I would say reflecting back on, you know, the last 50 years, uh, the real estate construction world has changed very little on how we do things to a certain degree compared to other industries. Mm -hmm. Yes, we work computer, but we still draw, you know, in a different medium, but how we build, how we, how we create, you know, at the grand scale, we haven't changed a lot uh, compared to our daily life. Uh, but I think the last five years that has started to change. So uh, awareness of efficiency of how we use materials and sustainability and, and, and how we produce an AI. And so I think there is a small wave that has been happening kind of independent of COVID. Um, but just historically, our industry has been slow in adapting uh, those new technologies. Uh, the design world has started to change and, and now I think the uh, production uh, fabrication is starting to change, uh, partially bringing things back locally. Uh, and how technology changes how we interact with buildings, I think the COVID event is gonna uh, fasten certain uh, technologies that maybe before were seen as nice to have, but not essential. Uh, and so the, the, the way of monitoring a building and the healthness of the air uh, or not having to touch things before they were kind of gadgets or somebody had a vision to be an extra healthy building, those are going to become much more essential rather than uh, bonuses. Uh, and so I think the COVID is, is going to uh, open up the idea of embedding technology in our daily lives and how we interact with buildings. So Ariane, uh, I guess it's the same question for you. How, uh, how can like technologies impact our life uh, furthermore? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very broad question. I think, I think over the past years that, that we shifted in our office with a, with a strong focus let's say from sustainability, really from the energy side to, towards health. Also Ben van Berkel, the founder of our office has been holding the, the chair at Harvard uh, around the subject of health and architecture. And he's been driving our studio quite heavily on, on research, but also implementing that. And we've been trying to do that in our buildings already over, over a long time period, much more focusing, for example, on how we could create the freshest air in an office environment. What kind of systems do we need for that? How do we, support that from the, the actual design of the building. And I think this, this is something where we really see it paying off also in post-occupancy research that it has an enormous impact on sick leave, on the productivity in these buildings. So we see a shift that, that, that started, let's say over the last five, six years, really materializing right now. And, and we think we are on the right path with that solution. Our, in, in essence, we, we always look at Toward, let's say towards the outside at the environment and how can we reduce the energy use of the buildings and, and now suddenly we are realizing that our bodies are simply not 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 built for for sitting inside and that our buildings are in essence unhealthy environments you know our bodies need high levels of, of daylight that you can actually only experience to to be outside our bodies still think we're hunting on the, on the fields with with some spears because evolution simply goes so slow and and this is where we think we should focus on design. So that's, that's bringing nature into the building, the notion of biophilia, uh, looking really on how can we create the best fresh air. And I think especially in this COVID situation, I think it's a major driving principle that we can show our clients to simply push the dirty air, for example, against the ceilings instead of mixing fresh air with dirty air. These are strong concepts that, that really speak to people's imagination now and, and I think we over the past years we really had to convince our clients on the importance of these aspects and now it comes as a natural so I think it, it will continue and then I think that the third notion that comes together with that is the use of of let's say digital technology in, in buildings which I still think is very much driven from um, the technology side and not so much from the human side so I think the examples that we've seen over the past years are, are really on more on a gadget level. Um, you know, it's, it's nice that you can, you know, use your phone to, to, to steer the lighting in a building, but I think it's really not the future. I think we want buildings that predict uses. So I think we should really have the uses of AI in buildings to really 
make the building functioning, let's say 95% of the time to kind of how it learns from its users, how it should perform. And, and then of course there should still be choice in, in the buildings because that's the main thing that is, is driving people, both in cities and in buildings that, that if people don't have choices, they're, they're simply not happy. You know, in this situation of kind of working from our home environments, we didn't have a choice. And then you see this kind of strong urge on, on going out, go to meet people. And, and we kind of certainly start valuing these aspects. And we think it functions on every building typology in the same way that, that the building should, should kind of predict and, and provide options for people to choose from, but it's the individual that can choose related to the kind of work he has to do or the kind of activity, what kind of environment fits best to them. And I think the digital technology can really support in that. So I'm not seeing it so much as a drafting tool, but much more on an interactive tool, offering you the choice and possibility. So yeah, I think it's exciting times on, on that level. And, and yeah, we, we really kind of drive a lot of research on that. And, and we really also really try to promote this thinking with, with our clients to, to really go beyond what, what our current understanding is of, of a building. Um, Jacob, do you think that uh, new technological advancement will change drastically how we change our cities or are they just going to stay as a tool? I mean, the, it can easily just be a gadget, uh, but I, I don't think it will kind of disappear uh, either on the short or long term. I actually think the the whole uh, digitalization uh, for us now, we are, we are architects and we are creating buildings and, and in cities and so on. I actually think it's the probably the the greatest opportunity, but also responsibility that has come to the field of architecture, because finally it's, it's not only about a, a matter of taste and look and feel and uh, passion and so on, but it's actually now we can both inform what we are what we are designing, but we can also prove uh, a proof of concept. We can we can work on an evidence base uh, rather than you know taste and and so on. Uh, so I think that's a huge uh, step forward uh, and. It, as I said, it gives an opportunity, but also I think it gives a responsibility for us being Arctic, architects, uh, creating the cities and, and the buildings. And then you can say within uh, our design methodology, I actually think it's a fantastic relief uh, again, because having these tools actually enables us to focus on the creative part and the, the making of things, uh, because uh, I mean, we can, we can script and all do things. So the repetitiveness and so on, and the you can say the um, getting all the data in. I mean, working off uh, databases and so on. We don't have to go to the library. We can sort of do simple things, and then we will get the information again. I think that will free up time to actually uh, work uh, closer and more continuously on the creative part. Um, what we are designing in terms of buildings, I mean, what we are and how the buildings are performing on the short, how they're performing on the short and the long term, I think that's about to be seen. Uh, I think it's we need to again we need to get over the the gadget feel and I think the the, the worst term uh, I I can think of that is when everyone go to a conference and talk about smart cities. I mean, it, it's it becomes. I mean, it's almost like a supplier's uh, Christmas uh, evening because it's all about what can you sell and can you put all sorts of things and devices on your building and inside your building. But where's the whole human aspect of side and the healthiness and the well-being and all that? I think that has to come first. So it's also uh, by that, I mean, it's important that the technology is driven by humans and it's not the other way around. Otherwise, we're going to fail big time. Uh, so guys, I want to talk a bit about your personal projects and let's start uh, with SOM. So Kim, which of your projects uh, in the pipeline are you like particularly looking forward uh, to and why? Well, I um, particularly we just are, uh, finished uh, design development on a project in, uh, in my studio in Buenos Aires, uh, Catalina Rio. And it's it's an office building, but we, uh, with the client's uh, vision of doing something different, we were really uh, able to rethink what you would typically think for a spec office building, what it would do. It's like in downtown Argentina, a, a country and a city that's been going through really rough times over the last 10 years and, and being part of a, of an, of a team 
where there's an, an idea to reposition the downtown. Uh, and while being a commercial building, it really became about repositioning a neighborhood and, and creating, extending and creating connectivities uh, in the zone where we're building. And so the, the heart of the project there is, is really about creating a neighborhood point, not just for the building, but actually for the larger community and be a hinge point in activating underutilized land that is literally right there and, and gives that access to the outdoor space. Uh, and so it really embeds a lot of the items we have been talking about here, about access to the outdoors, uh, community engagement. Uh, and so uh, it's, I'm very excited about that project because it embeds all those, those ideas uh, before the pandemic already, and, and it just proves that the, the essence of that idea is a, is a right one. Jacob, uh, which particular project are you looking uh, forward uh, to? I assume I cannot set all of them, but I, I, I think it's, uh, I think the ones that we are doing at the moment that really uh, is, is, is high on the agenda here is, is the more, uh, the more the transformational projects, the things where basically, we are leaving things as they are, and we are kind of really reinforcing the, the narrative about the legacy before we kind of move forward. Uh, and we're doing uh, the uh, transformation of the Royal Shipyard in, in Poland as an example. So really preserving the past and bring that into the future. Um, I also think that we, we're working with Volvo. Uh, and here it's, 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 it's about understanding the future mobility, uh, but also working here with, with uh, I mean, 100% wood uh, building, a wood structure. Uh, so think again that we are thinking into recycling and upcycling and we're looking into the CO2 emission of a building. Uh, and it's not something that is going to look good for the next 20 years, but really thinking about the longer runs and the commitment to a society or, or a nation. Uh, so the big picture is, is, is super fascinating. And then there are so many opportunities, but we have so many things to learn. Uh, and that's probably why we all enjoy what we're doing here, because we can, we can make a difference and people are looking at us. Definitely. And uh, uh, Aran, um, what exciting project uh, is the UN Studio working on? Well, we're, we're a large practice, like, like uh, the colleagues here in the call as well. Um, project I'm particularly looking forward to, we, we have a big headquarter building that is part of a mixed use in the city center Amsterdam mm -hmm. under construction right now. So we really have seen that, that going up and luckily the construction side is still, still going on. And that that building will really emphasize a lot on this kind of healthy building aspects. So it will have really kind of smart climate system, but it's also really community building. And it also showed us that, that, that it will ask for different means of transportation. Uh, you know, we will have 5,000 employees working in this building and it will just take 50 parking spots. So it also shows the value of, of putting these kind of mixed use developments in kind of city center areas instead of putting them at the outskirts. And so that, that's one of the projects we just completed a uh, transformation of a 1960s building where we really kind of stripped it down to its structure and really sculpted a new building out of it, like really living up to current day standards. Um, so it's very exciting to, to work with the kind of something that somebody else created in the past and seeing how you could make something new out of it instead of tearing the whole thing down and putting something new on the same spot. And like I said, uh, like we're working on the Amsterdam uh, cable car right now, which is um, a project that was initiated by two citizens. So it was also uh, crowdfunded in the early stages and it was really brought up from the citizens and to the attention of the public authorities, which kind of embrace the project right now. So it's, it's quite exciting to, to think about new ways of public transportation, and really working with, with citizens that, that brought that idea up as an idea. And, and I think these are very powerful projects that, that people really drive it from their hearts in, instead of like from kind of commercial aspect, but really seeing the needs in a city on both on levels of, of connecting city parts that were separated by, by a river, but also looking at sustainability aspects. So yeah, there's a lot of exciting projects in the, in the, in the pipeline. And the diversity drives us that we can really connect the, the, the skills between projects and move thinking from one skill to the other. So it's, it's exciting times. Well, good luck for everyone uh, with the future project. 
And to wrap it up, I want to ask you if you want to share one final thought uh, with the audience. Whoever wants to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I think that the, the thing that I want to, to give along, I think we're all quite kind of not knowing what hit us, I think, in the beginning of this pandemic. And I think it's very important to keep positivism. And I think we should really see the opportunity that, that this can really provoke us in, in our creative thinking, but our creative thinking will also be essential to find ways out of this, this pandemic crisis that is now turning into an economic, economic crisis as well. And, and I really see that this will also learn people that we have to do things different and now is the time. I think it's really as disruptive, I said in the beginning of this, this talk, that people are open, have their minds open to, to new ways of thinking right now. And that's what I would like to kind of bring out to, to keep up the positive spirit and really think how our creativity can support these changes. Yeah, I would I would reiterate that similarly that uh, while we're all cooped up in our in our houses, uh, the things that we miss now we realize how important they are and and really see them as an opportunity to think about them as as just individual citizens and and push the larger community to 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 really fight for the importance of those things, and us as designers uh, where we're kind of multifaceted always connecting uh, different aspects uh, of, of, of life and society, we have a really important role in, in helping to push that forward on our projects, but also on the policy side, because at the end, policy is, is, a, is a key uh, component to, to, to drive change. I think this has been, a, I mean, it's really a point of time in, in all our lives so that we, we should really kind of pause down and really rethink and, and spend time on things that matters and where we can make a difference and by all means we're all enjoying being on this planet we should preserve it and as it was our like the, the one and only baby uh, and, and because there are kids and generations to come uh, so we slow down a little bit and spend time on things that create value and uh, make yourself happy. Thank you so much for your time, Kim, Ariane, and Jacob. It was really a pleasure talking to you. And um, good luck with all your future projects, I would say. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.